we're so happy to have Madeleine Brissendorf here. Uh, uh, and it's, it's such a joy, actually. Uh, and I would say we're here to celebrate your work and discuss your work, uh, but also your wisdom. Yes, like in a birthday, but also your wisdom with a wisdom. S8. W-I-S-H, uh, <laughs> the D-O-M, as you, you like it. Uh, artist, a sculptor, a teacher, collector, uh, but also the great impact of fun of, the, of, of your past, present, and future contributions to the world are basically what we're so excited to be celebrating, like in a birthday today. <laughs> uh, and, and this world, like the idea, your contributions to the world means a lot when we talk about Madeleine Brissendorf. Uh, because uh, you're one of the actually few living people that has your own world, according to the Swiss Architectural Museum that in 2019 did this amazing exhibition and book, The World of Madeleine Brissendorp. Um, an exhibition that actually shocked everyone when the photographs of your apartment in London started to circulate, your amazing collection of dictators and, and dead <laughs> figures and... Uh, all these things have started to be seen with this big thing, life without objects. Uh, that still aside. shocks me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, I think that um, it's also something else. I think it's a homecoming. Uh, you came to New York in 1972, 72. right? One, yeah, 72. Oh, 71? No, 71 72. Or two? Yeah, yeah, okay, you're right. the, the, actually the year I was born. Uh, and you mm. went to Ithaca, right? Yeah. Uh, the first place. Uh, and I, I cannot imagine what would be to have you in the same room that Colin Rowe, for instance, in Ithaca, right? He was around at that time, and the, this very abstract notion of architecture that could be explained through the maths of ideal maths of the home and whatever, all these things that we were reading. That, that, and then Madeleine Brissendor unfolding architecture in all these different layers, realities, uh, <laughs> scales, uh, presences, lives. And so it's so exciting somehow to think that you're coming back to New York after many years, right? You haven't been here for many years, many right? Many years, yeah. So this is a homecoming and a celebration for us that you're doing this here in, in GSAP, in Columbia GSAP. Um, it's actually the 12th uh, Kenneth Frampton lecture. This is a series that is honoring the legacy of uh, Kenneth Frampton, uh, with whom you've been in conversations and discussions often, and probably many, many other things. But I want to remind everyone that Frampton actually uh, wrote about the early team, the founders of OMA, uh, and he wrote something actually very, very beautiful in 1976. He said, OMA presents an alternative, an alternative reality of radical potential, and one which is equally critical of the positivistic constraints of both capitalism and communism. The city for OMA is not paved with gold, but with culture. And I wonder what it means, culture here, what we could actually interpret that means culture here, but I think all this density of, that you bring into architecture, it's probably what we could make of this culture now. Uh, Madeleine Brissendorf studied at Ritbelt. Uh, she then worked on restoration and frescoes and as a designer of stage customs, books, and jewelry, right? Uh, five years later, you enrolled the Central St. Martin School of Art in London, right? And that's uh, the time that the, or you left that to came to New York, right? Or to Ithaca yeah. first, yeah. then to uh, your paintings. You produce paintings for books, magazines, covers that were exhibited at the Guggenheim Museum, the Max Protect Gallery, the, Fent the Pompidou, the uh, uh, Stedelijk Amsterdam the, uh, the Museum, the Gallery at, Math, at Tokyo, at Berlin, and that was probably the time that you did the cosmic. Uh, the Cosmic Man, right? And uh, the, 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 <laughs> the cover of that, right? What was yeah, that? Yeah. Was more, more or less that, which I, I totally love this man that is kind of made of bubbles and is, is uh, a cosmic uh, presence. Uh, from mid 1980s, you taught at the uh, and design, uh, uh, you, you taught art and design in a number of schools, including the AA and the Edinburgh School of Art. You work with Charles Yanks through your entire life, right? And you, you will talk about that later. Um, uh, you work with your daughter, Charlie, on several books and art projects and many, many other things, and your work is everywhere. And we, we've been discussing this, and it's collected in all the major museums and published everywhere, so I, I don't think we, we need to go through that. But, the, but, but I, I want to, to also say that for 
many people in this room, uh, you are clearly working as an architect through architecture. Uh, and, but also I know that you prefer to say that you're not an architect, that you laugh I'm about not architects. An architect. right? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but, and that you laugh about, uh, or you, you, you make fun of architects, you laugh of architects, right? And no, I l only laughed about Corbusier. <laughs> <laughs> And, and probably Mostly what he wrote, he's a very good architect, but <laughs> <laughs> some things he wrote are just so funny. So this is an opportunity to laugh about many architects, about many architectures, about many other things uh, with and you. Now I have a chance to laugh about me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and laugh about you, with you, and, and through you, and through your work. Uh, but, but I think it's very important what is happening here, and, and the format is going to be very uh, informal, I would say. Uh, you're going to speak for a while, uh, we will uh, then go through a series of pot images that you selected, and we I will have a conversation that at one point we will open to the audience. So make sure to take notes about everything that, that you want to, to ask afterwards, and we will go through that. And before okay. we start, I want to show this image that you sent us, uh, this beautiful image here in New York in 1972 probably, right? Three, yeah. Three? In your apartment on 7th Street, right? I just uh, found that slide. I never <laughs> knew it. <laughs> so this is a great look. moment. Please join me welcoming Madeleine Brissender. <laughs> to, to Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, we'll tell you something about my very time before I was born. And that's a bit about um, my first uh, contribution to my family. I was born at a time when ADHD hadn't been invented yet. In 1945, <laughs> in a small town sandwiched between Utrecht and Amsterdam, in a street called Vermeerlaan, Vermeer Lane, yeah? never feeling the weight of art history on our shoulders two months before peace broke out and the worst hunger winter in memory. I acquired the prenatal reputation of having saved my family from starvation when my mother, who was massively pregnant with me, took a ride on a bike made by my father with his home-carved wooden tires just before her, not just before her, but for many in the village, as rubber was unavailable for five years of German occupation. She cycled to nearly far nearby farms to exchange precious goods for flour, eggs and potatoes, etc. At some point, several German soldiers motioned her to the stop and demanded to take her bike. But she was able to show how her obvious pregnancy and birth certificates of th her three starving children at home. And thankfully, they let her go. So this was my earliest contribution to my family. But later, this was somewhat more nebulous. I was the youngest child with two conflicting needs, wanting both to be left alone and to be heard. I had an extreme ability to close myself off from the record around me while drawing and constructing, and at the same time demanding attention by screaming over my family's arguments. I still have that terrible thing that I scream over people when, <laughs> <laughs> when I want to, want to be heard. And they say, shut up, I'm, let me finish. Um, where am I? There were two schools for us to choose from, a brutal old-fashioned one where kids were still beaten and a Maria Montessori school. So it was an easy choice for an enlightened family with a lineage of artists and poets. At this Montessori school, my nursery teacher, Madame Bock, was trained expert in dyslexia and she potted, spotted me at, as early as five. I, started where I stayed with her for three weeks, and I was ecstatic, surrounded by kindness, and her two affectionate daughters. I felt like an only child for once. A part of her teaching, as a part of her teaching, she placed words like door, wall, kitchen, bathroom, all around the place. And while I didn't appear to notice them, my visual brain must have perceived them subconsciously. So these random words taught me to read without me realizing. I could not attach sounds to one letter, 
visually to me the letters D, B, P and Q were all the same, only turned around and upside down. So later my party trick for, trick for my friends was writing whole sentences backwards and upside down. My traumatized parents having to survive through the war with very young children through extremely cold winters with no sign of global warming on the horizon starting, started to write a crime novel together as if that was a normal thing to start doing. <laughs> my grandfather had his own publishing company for the sole reason of publishing his calculating dictionary that had, he had been working on for years. By the time he finally finished his hefty book, calculators had already been invented, but he still shipped some of his books to small cash-strapped businesses in Holland, Denmark, Germany, and maybe more. When he died, he had a room full of dictionaries all piled up to the ceiling. I don't know what happened to them, but I took one home. His petitioned family came from a wealthy shipping company, so he could afford to follow his dream, however slight or grand. He married a fra frail artistic girl from a respectable family of horse painters and poets. She died before I was born, but the pictures of her showed a sad face with lowered eyebrows, maybe, I speculated, for having married a domineering man with such a self-righteous character. His military regime style upbringing didn't blend with my father's gentle and kind character, more resembling his mother. So his daughter and older son were his blatant favorites. When he acquired a dog, he threw the puppy in the river to see if it was tough enough to join his family. He forced heaps of calcium powder down his children's throats to give them strong bones, which made my father suffer horrendously with painful kidney stones. But otherwise, uh, as a grandfather, he was kind and adored us all. His cookery, he cooked every Sunday and was too stubborn to look at recipes, so he, his puddings were so tough and robust that when my father once flipped his pudding up in the air, it stuck to the ceiling. And when he caught it back on the plate, it was still intact. We all clapped. <laughs> <laughs> he was thrifty and always offered us rock-hard cooking chocolate <laughs> from an elegant crystal bowl. The incongruous, incongruousness, I can't say that word, was not wasted on us. He had been educated in Germany in the wood trade, and as a young man, he traveled the world to buy wood. Russia, Argentina, Ca Canada, etc. He was not a natural storyteller, but we insisted to tell us about Russia. Very, very cold. Mm -hmm. Nice people and good food. But we insisted, how about Moscow? The underground, very deep. We couldn't expect more. He loved figure skating and carried on till he was 80. And we would skate next to him to make sure he wouldn't hit the ice. And despite the yeah, occasional wobble, he never did. His brother was eagerly following his dream to breed exotic chickens he'd seen on famous old paintings, the ones with enormous feathery boots, which came in all colors. Once he had managed that, he died. And when Ram, Ram introduced me to his parents for the first time, his father, who worked for Polygon News, asked me, are you family of that Friesendorp that breeds chickens from old paintings? <laughs> <laughs> he had interviewed him on his chicken farm. Yes, that's my uncle. And that was my introduction to the Kulhas family. <laughs> 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 and that's... <laughs> <laughs> now I tell you a story I wrote when I was... Um, uh, years ago, uh, which is now, what is it? Ten years ago, uh, I woke up with an incredible storm outside the window, and I remembered this, this story of uh, a, a thing that happened in my family when I was 14 or 15. And uh, this is a Dutch uh, coloring book, and uh, we always were sort of uh, coloring these books. <laughs> <laughs> very uh, Holland themed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I 
This is the start. I met a man who asked his friend Spike Milligan, where are you, was giving the answer, somewhere. You always have to be somewhere. This doesn't apply to Holland. In Holland, you can be nowhere. In fact, there's a lot of nowhere in Holland. You can be in a place, look around, and it's exactly the same as somewhere else in Holland. A flat green plain, a miniature skyline at the horizon, horizon with several spires pointing up, like sharpened pencils. A testimi testimony to the multiple really, really, I can't speak anymore. I have to, <laughs> have to have get my throat oiled. <laughs> um, testi testimony to the multiple religions Holland traditionally accommodated. Some houses scattered about, one interchangeable with the next, for lack of compelling features. A few trees, a moat, a fence, and there it ends. Except it doesn't, it never ends. The landscape unfolds with unrelenting sameness, mile after mile. When finally you come to a forest, you can be pretty sure that behind it, is this flat green will appear again, this provocative, provocative nothingness before your eyes. We, the Dutch, have learned to love it, just as we've learned to love potatoes. To counteract the destructive boredom of colorlessness, we filled our Dutch nursery coloring books with screaming primal color crayons. It made us feel that we were somewhere doing something. You always ended up with a red cloud, a blue cow, and a yellow windmill. <laughs> My sister had a boyfriend who came along one summer to our rented cottage in the north of Holland, in the middle of this unyielding green. My family consisted of my mother, my stepfather, and his son, my two older sisters, my older brother, and me. It was raining with a constancy typical of Dutch summers. My brother would stand in front of the window days on end and sing his dismal little song, a dissonant version of I can hear the rain. Oh, how it's raining, how it's raining. I can hear it from my warm bed. I hear the rain singing. Can you, do you know that song? <laughs> how no one notice, notices this sad state of affairs. <laughs> In this miserable collective family mood, we had blazing arguments. Whose turn is it to peel the potatoes? As families invariably prey on outsiders to point out the ills of the world, we collectively turned to the unlucky boyfriend, suitably named <laughs> Martin Fierce. He, realizing immediately this was not just a potato peeling issue, <laughs> refused to comply. A family row ensued, wholly inappropriate to the scale of the matter and the setting. My brother stayed silently at the window, his eyes glazing over, as if to soft focus the racket around him. Martin took his stuff and stormed out the door. My sister was praised extensively for letting him go. It is notorious dif notoriously difficult to storm out into nowhere and end up somewhere. So he walked a mercilessly flat grassland for about an hour without looking back. We checked. Every now and then someone would go to the window and we would call out, is he still there? <laughs> and the answer would invariably be, yes, I can still see him. Or, he still is out there and then, I can still hear his, see his head. When finally he disappeared, there was no, where's no sign of relief, just a muted acknowledgement that nothing had been achieved and nothing lost. His lack of imprint on the landscape had left the pasture more hostile and more horizontal than ever before. Well, that's about Holland. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I grew up. <laughs> Ah, now some serious business. <laughs> yes, we move yes. on. Well, this, first this, I guess. <laughs> you you sent us this slide, and I was wondering oh if yeah. you could explain yes. a little bit. This is a funny guy who uh, put this on the internet. He's called uh, Drew Toothpaste, he's called. And my friends made a nice frame for me, and I na they, na they made a sort of a, a line where I can put a star where I am. And it's yeah. permanently on fuck off. <laughs> 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 but it always was my working sort of thing. We always went too late yeah. and then 
did all the work while crying the, with the deadline. We organized the block, like your images in eight blocks. We're going to start with early work, right? And, and before that, I want to say, I see there's a lot of people standing in the back. There's plenty yeah. of seats, uh, empty seats yeah, yeah, here in here. front. So please join us <laughs> if you want. Come forward, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> we have to fill this. <laughs> okay, early work. <laughs> so I'm going they to pass them to. slow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> first, the first round, and then we'll, I'll go back. Okay. So you oh yeah, I, I was 16 or 15. That was my cartoons that I made when I was that age. And I made them for all my friends in high school. And uh, my first boyfriend in high school sent these to me quite mm -hmm. recently. <laughs> I had forgotten about them. This was at the <laughs> Montessori. At the Montessori I don't know school. why it was all about nuns and priests, but mm. uh, that, there you are. This was some of your early work, right? Yeah, it was very, uh, very early. And who, who did you make that these was for? in uh, the uh, Central School of Art? I did yeah. etching. Mm. And uh, and were these student exercises, or were they made for galleries, or? I did for myself because I was doing it at night, and mm -hmm. during the day I was driving around to get publishers to <laughs> to give me work for book covers and things. So I colored them all because they're more interesting. New York, number two. What do you think now about these, these images? I mean, they've been everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can tell us a little bit more. The very first one, Do we really right? have to think, <laughs> tell you my thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll start I with... Made it this disgusting painting, because I yeah. thought they must have, they must have terrible taste, these two. So, and then the Italians, when they want, didn't want to use this cover of Delius New York, so they, they took out the painting and they just put the, the figures in bed. That mm -hmm. was very funny. They couldn't stand it. They obviously didn't see the <laughs> point of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then it became the, the, the sort of Miami and then lighthouse yeah. in the next. Uh, and then we insisted that modernity could would yeah. in, in would mm -hmm. interrupt this whole love affair. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so uh, I put the... Uh, Modernist, modernist, well, modernist now. Mm -hmm. Well, people still make this sort of RCA buildings now, don't they? They make them in, in other school. shapes, a lot of <laughs> steps. We have to ask the <laughs> students, but... Uh, but the maybe, Madelon, maybe it would be good to know a little bit the story of the image. How did it start? Uh, well, the what is the people yeah. say, why did you put bills in bed together? But it was then it was sort of at the time that everybody was in bed together, and <laughs> it was the 60s, free love. And my brother-in-law had already done two airplanes in bed together, uh -huh. and Steinberg had already done an exclamation mark and a question mark in bed together. Mm -hmm. So it was not so, uh, now it looks a bit funny, but then it was sort of quite a normal thing to do. <laughs> normal. Yeah. <laughs> But <laughs> but they're kind of surprised. The right? like to do this uh, the normal. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in a way, there's all this violence here in this image, right? Like they're surprised by this person or kind of this building that is, uh, like, lighting them. There's all these people watching through the window. There's also, I mean, your work is always so nice, so fun, so but also so dark, right? There's sort of a dark side in <laughs> these images. There's a violence, always. You really want always. to my, know my dark side? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, think, oh. I was very obsessed with uh, Statue of Liberty. I, I sort of identified with her a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but you, you, you don't call her the Statue of Liberty, you call her Mrs. Caligari, is that yeah, right? Yeah, but that it? was, we were just seen Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and we were completely obsessed with that film. Mm -hmm. 
It was so funny because that film, everything is crooked. But when, we, when you come out, of, it becomes normal. So when you come out, you think, oh, everything is straight, uh, mm -hmm. strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a watercolor, right? Yeah. And you draw it first with pencil or something? How, how do you work? I just pencil, drawing, and then color it, color it in. And, and always it's an incredibly small sort of intricate skill, right? Like in the first well, image. Well, as you can see, I had a very small table. <laughs> so yeah. There was no... There was no, uh, it was underneath our uh, lot bed. Uh, was it really was a, a tiny little alcove? <laughs> was it a practicality thing? The, the it was very small, really? yeah. I mean, I, I think Andres's earlier question about the darkness, I want to, to push a little bit on that as well. I had the same question, but there's so much, well, there's the people sort yes, of sir. gazing in, there's Lady Liberty sort of missing her arm, but also some of the other. Maybe we can go like a few of the, um, the, um, the later works. There is a, all this brokenness, things sort of falling apart. Yeah. And, and, and I agree. I think your work is incredibly optimistic and, and positive in many ways. But there is always this sort of dark undertone. Here again, this is a self-emulation, self I think it's, it's, it's called. So well, uh, I don't know. I just, um, yeah, well, at that age, you're a bit dark, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And you're 25, <laughs> 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 you <have> dark thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> you look for drama, mm -hmm. you, you know. And I collected all these postcards about New York and... Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, because some of the postcards that are, you know, highly sort of categorized, there were, you were also themes of, of like electric chairs, I think I read somewhere you were collecting, there were some of them. Yeah, the we used to call this, I used to call this, uh, wish you were here cards. Yeah. <laughs> the electric Most chair. horrific <laughs> cards. <laughs> <laughs> From Wait. prisons and long tables for the prisoners, they have crazy cards that you, yeah. why do you make postcards of this? You can't say wish you were here, where can you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or a guy on an incredible crevice, you know, a yeah. gorge sitting on the edge. Mm -hmm. Wish you were here. <laughs> <laughs> I How think much we of this was the, I mean, you were collecting postcards. You yeah. were going around the city. You were talking to there everyone. There was supposed to be postcard for the Delia's New York. But yeah. I saw this crazy postcard of Americana, mm -hmm. the biggest yeah. potato, Idaho potato on a train and the biggest mm -hmm. Everything the biggest, the highest, the deepest, <laughs> we the have most some dangerous. Of, that, I think, uh, <laughs> of the, 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 the gigantic the strawberries. The biggest jackrabbit. Yeah. <laughs> but in a way, this, for instance, for me is fascinating when we see it from a perspective like now. I mean, uh, in the 70s, for instance, New York was also facing many difficulties, right? It was a city that was in bankrupt. Uh, there were all these issues that the city was facing. But when we look at it from a contemporary perspective and we see the floodings on the grid, we see the broken symbols of uh, the U.S. and the U.S. democracy and welcome uh, uh, tradition, welcoming tradition. But it was also a time of uh, uh, super uh, the actors, super famous uh, actresses and, mm -hmm. you know, the f so... Celebrity the, culture. The, these buildings were also sort of the super famous actors in yeah. in architecture. So it was sort of like um, they were all iconic. The, the, this Marilyn Monroe and you know, uh, so mm -hmm. celebrity was, was they were c the architectural celebrities basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the other parts? For instance, there's always a huge presence of nature. There's always a huge presence of, for instance, many of them, of uh, territorial dimensions. There's always the clouds. There's all these other things that are also brought in in the grid and in dialogue with the buildings. How do you feel well, about we, that? We, we, we lived in a small town and with lots surrounded by forest and trees. So when my mother brought me out once to, I saw this cloud and I cried because I had never yeah. seen <laughs> this mm -hmm. heavy stuff above us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was always sort of covered. So I always had nature around me. So there's always a bit of 
hunger for nature and mm -hmm. sea and water. Water was a big thing in Holland. I don't have to explain this to anyone, I don't think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it always flooded. How was the reaction of architects to this? Because this was not happening, let's say, in an invisible place. All these drawings were exhibited, were, I mean, incredibly famous. At least, for instance, in the interview that, that you did for the world of modern Britain, there you, you explained and you, you respond to Betty saying, <laughs> it was crucial, right? She's in, the in, in culprit, the don't successful. ask her. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, your, your pr the presence of your, of your drawing on the front of the call, the call were made the book very successful, right? And the previous version without that. No, but I mean, so people thought we were totally taking the piss. No, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> this was not academic uh, work, you know. This was just joking around. And in a way, I've never stopped doing things that didn't make me laugh. Hmm. I just want to. <laughs> so you said it was not well received in New York at all, right? Huh? You no. said it was not well received at no, all at the time. I was basically taking away New York from mm -hmm. the people who were really seriously studying New York, you know. What, what was their critique? Well, there was a lot of things that were myths and that were written as if it, like there was one myth that all the uh, Indians were the ones who were uh, working high up on the skyscrapers. This is not true, you know that. And that was a nice myth, and he felt like these myths are more interesting than the reality. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, it's sort of embracing all the, you know, mm. the untrue realities about New York, you know. I, I heard you quoting Einstein at some point that Einstein said, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. Yes. <laughs> <So that's laughs> yeah. And this was happening. You have to listen to Einstein all, always. <laughs> Madeleine, this was happen happening while REM was also, I mean, all basically there's an inevitable dialogue between this and, of course, the Lyrics New York as a text. How was that relationship? You were well, collecting different things. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't was wanting to have that. He had a very nice cover for Lyrics New York already, which was a cinerama of the World Fair. Uh, nice blue, all the things in a round. It was a very mm. nice cover. But then James Rames, he went to Frankfurt World um, book, book Fair and he said there was an Italian guy, Baroni, who had your cover, your mm. painting on, the, on his cover. And everybody was looking at it, so you're crazy if you don't use that painting for your cover. And then he decided, all right, <laughs> I'll do that. And then he put all my paintings that I had been painting, the whole series, in every chapter. I was quite surprised <laughs> <laughs> because he thought it would fit it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, because the paintings existed. All right, then. Sorry, no. Sorry? No, I was going to say the paintings really existed in their own right, right? There was no... There was no connection right. to, uh, to the store, to the Delirious New York. Yeah. But... Uh <laughs> and you, before you said that you were collecting the big potatoes, and these <laughs> other things, the postcards, the Americana, and Ren was doing something different. How different it was? Like you were... Well, he was looking at every old book. We, he, he, we, we were um, collecting magazines and he said, take all the magazines that are from 1929. That was his main time that he thought everything happened then mm -hmm. and was written about. So we collected everything 19 all these um, old magazines, it was, uh, I didn't know why he wanted 29, but then that mm -hmm. was when the, the skyscrapers, one wanted to be higher than the other, and one did its spire a bit higher, <laughs> so that it was higher than, there was this competition, <laughs> it was very funny. Maybe, uh, and when we spoke earlier, you mentioned when you were living in Ithaca first before going to New York, you would go to all these thrift stores. And, and one thing I noticed, you would explain how you would purchase all these things, but they were always Art Deco. Like you would Art Deco, you know, bracelets, yeah, Art Deco ties. Yeah, yeah. Art de <laughs> so what's your relationship with Art Deco? You seem to have a... No, I was very interested in, it's so beautiful, all the, uh, all the beautiful... Uh, 
diners, they were all Art Deco, mm -hmm. streamlined. Uh, that didn't happen. It was such an Art Deco explosion in, in the 30s. So, and all, everything, every cup, every spoon, there were always Art Deco <laughs> things. So I collected whatever I could. And the uh, depression plates, what do they call the depression plates? All the different color square plates. Ah. I love those. It was so different, we, you know, we were so Calvinist in Holland, mm -hmm. you know, everything was red, gray, brown, you know, yeah. white and black. <laughs> no, the nowhere. <laughs> Let's go. Oh. So it was an exciting moment to be in New York at that time. Yeah. What about this Saturno? And everything was it cheap. I w even, you know, plates that were 25 cents, that plate. Mm -hmm. I can get them for 15. Now I'm sorry <laughs> that I didn't buy them all. Because <laughs> now then people started to, after that, people mm -hmm. started to collect them as well. This one is called Greed, right? Is that the kind yeah. Now that guy that eats New York, that uh, is from a, a painting in, uh, I think, in Italian church. I've uh, forgotten which, which city it was. Bologna or something. Do you know where that church is? No. Any Italians in the room? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it also looks like the Saturno in the Prado, right? Eating mm -hmm. uh, his son, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> destroying the time in a way or fighting. Yeah, it was the time of disaster movies. Yeah. What about the pipes here? We have lover, pipe lovers here. <laughs> well, that was a postcard. Uh, you saw the belly of New York, the underbelly. And that uh, I thought that's so Freudian. You have the, you know, the subconscious of New York, and the, and then you have the Freudian images: the gorge, the tunnel, the, yeah. the you know, uh -huh. only the window has, <laughs> it has a, a constructive uh, theme. You said the subconscious of New York. The subconscious. And where would it be in the pipes? Underneath the water. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much underneath New York <laughs> when you realize. Huh? Right, right here, there's water streaming <laughs> in under the auditorium. Yeah. What about this one? Well, this was for... Uh, uh, in Holland, you have a thing in Holland that is a 1% ruling. And every building that's being built has to have 1% in art. So there was a competition and I entered the competition with this broken thing that goes through the window. Was it for a mural? Or and uh, the 1% was consumed by all the <laughs> things, other things they did, so it was disappeared. So that wasn't done. And this was for this uh, magazine designed quarterly and uh, they wanted the cover so I made it a, a birthday party of the two buildings <laughs> 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 and it's ten years later <laughs> and, they have and all the postmodern right. postmodern buildings there and they have children because right? I think those were that were <coughs> basically their children yeah, no yeah. postmodernism and, and uh, the, yeah. the Gilandes, what do you call them the trains they're all upside down entries from the Biennale, this <laughs> postmodern yeah. post Biennale. Biennale yeah. Yeah. How was your work received by the postmodern architects? God knows, I don't talk to <laughs> 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 I don't talk to postmodern architects. <laughs> <laughs> There was a postcard, uh, a stamp I made for, uh, and uh, I sent them to somebody who collected my painting, and he just gave it to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Mm. The a painting stamp. of the first painting of the buildings in bed together. Okay. And that's my I collected all these juicers. And that's one of the streamlined juices that <laughs> came from uh, that came from uh, 
crippled civilians in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Ram was giving a lecture, and I thought, I've heard that lecture, so I'm going to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to thrift stores. <laughs> and I found this enormous box in crippled civilians <laughs> with all metal things, and I thought, I said to the guy, what is this uh, Nazi helmet doing there? <laughs> and he said, that's <laughs> that's a juicer. <laughs> and he he put it all together. There was a thing that fitted perfectly. It was amazing. It was a real Bel Geddes kind of thing. It's so beautiful. What about electricity? Huh? Electricity. There's no electricity. It's ha ah, is it no, but I mean the, 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 the kind State. of storm. The oh. The lightning. Yeah. Oh, the lightning. The light <laughs> the lightning. Yeah. I just there was a lightning rod in that uh, building. I've never seen it happen, but. Imagined. Then, then, my friend Terry, who I met in uh, in Ithaca, like my friends who are sitting there, I met them in Ithaca as well, and they stayed friends forever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, I met her there, and she, um, she went. We went to collect things. She collected um, quilts, and I collected the cards and postcards mm -hmm. and. Anyway, so when we were all back in Europe, we went to uh, Belil one day where they had a house, and she said, we must make a... I'm doing a Paris, New York. There was all this Paris, Moscow, Paris, yeah. New York exhibitions. We have to do something because she worked for a television company. So we said, okay, and she, let's do something. And we shamelessly put all my paintings and made a story with all the <laughs> paintings from one to the other. <laughs> it's very funny. And then um, Jean-Pierre Jacquet, he was at a cartoon farm. He made a cartoon for us mm -hmm. of that uh, this storyboard. It was all sort of uh, and it was disaster movie type. It was broadcasted, right? On French television? Yeah, it was no. broadcast, yeah. Yeah, that's the uh, Italian version, cleaned up <laughs> version. <laughs> and I love this story. That's, yeah, well, I thought if you do it in Japan, the book is different. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, why don't you do it and then go around? But then they just cut it off, so it made no sense. In the end. <laughs> but I find this so <laughs> telling they of just you. It's they just, yeah, okay, we do it the other way around. But mm -hmm. the idea was that the, the Rockefeller Center would be uh, around the back, you know. But I love this story because I think it's so a telling total of... misunderstanding. Huh? <laughs> no, I think it's so telling of the sort of fragment. I don't think there's many artists who would want to have their image basically flipped <laughs> <laughs> or mirrored, I should say. Um, but there's a certain... No, it was just because the books are opening this way, no, not, <laughs> not that way. <laughs> the French the version, French. yeah, everybody had their own lettering. Cut. And this okay. is the original... And this is the original Baroni who took skyscrapers. And that's why this, this book happened. So, so this... This book existed, and then the publisher of the Lyrics No, it was just, a, it wasn't, well, he had written the book, I suppose, but mm -hmm. it was just a cover, because in, in the Frankfurt uh, uh, book fair, people, mm -hmm. uh, publishers go and look for books. Yes. So that's why James said, you must use that cover, because everybody was looking at, mm -hmm. what a strange cover. <laughs> so then he shamelessly used my other painting and turned it around <laughs> for permission. his other book, but I never knew this. Because of uh, Beatrice Kalumina, she had this uh, book exhibition about magazines and books, and there was a guy there that worked for you. He suddenly gave me that magazine, that book. <laughs> he said, did you know? I said, no, I <laughs> never knew. <laughs> So I thought, I'll ring them up and they'll ask some for some money. You've never been paid. <laughs> <laughs> I ring them up and they said, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so you can't uh, ask any money from a dead person, I'm afraid. 
that w that I learned. And, and this, I yes. always use this the, the slow uh, and inevitable march to oblivion. I call this, <laughs> this <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> first this one, then that one, and then that one, and the New York Daily. But Rem was right. He was really wanting to know whether his book, because everybody said, yeah, they would buy this book because it's a funny cover. No, he wanted to know, does that book sell without the cover? And of course it did sell yeah. because it was a really interesting book. So, and it was very popular. So without the cover, it's okay. These are <laughs> some, <laughs> some of my postcards. I was very interested in this, the obsession with big trees. <laughs> <laughs> People always <laughs> standing around with all these men around <laughs> the tree. Look how big it is. <laughs> <laughs> They're always, Merck is always so obsessed with biggest, tallest, deepest. <laughs> I think we have one of the, the, the biggest strawberries in the world as well, <laughs> if you will. And the house is built, the house is built this, uh, from tree trunks and in, in the tree trunk. There's a house in the tree, you know, with a cut off and just a roof on it. <laughs> Mother, but uh, also buildings like the ones that you do all are meant to be very big, right? And they were <laughs> celebrated as uh, gigantic and kind of big milestones yeah, yeah. in architecture, like this Discovery Channel engineering, whatever. Also, these trees are kind of funny, right? And you presented the buildings, like the one that has the little kind of tunnel for the car to go through. It's kind of yeah. all this massive tree, but then it becomes little kind of funny uh, 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 pass for cars. And, and also the buildings that somehow you're also making fun of them. You're putting mm. them in a weird situation, like where exposed. No, as it they was so it was so much invention. Also in America, people had no money and they just invented a way to to make a house, you know. Mm. And then all the endlessness of New York, the tunnels, the roads that end in the sort of nowhere. <laughs> we mm. once were driving in, I don't know where it was, in the middle of America from the East Coast to the West Coast. And in the middle, there was this, um, I looked at a mileage, an old, we had such an old ranch wagon, and all the nines went on zero. Yeah. I said, Ram, look, look this <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing on the mileage. <laughs> I said, what day is it today? And he said, it's the 24th of August. I said, wow, we've been married for two years. <laughs> Let's <laughs> celebrate. So we went to the first diner, and have big BLT <laughs> 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 and a glass of beer and we clanked and said happy anniversary. <laughs> potatoes. And there they are. Yeah. The big potatoes. The potatoes and <laughs> the strawberries, yeah. <laughs> Biggest potato and a man the on top as well. <laughs> Look, cabbages. he's trying to fi p point out how big it is. <laughs> it's so funny and babies okay. in all shapes. And Let's forms. move to number three, OMA. Yeah, that was, uh, oh, man, it's, am I doing this? Yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a thunderstorm now, <laughs> lightning in a minute. <laughs> so what was your uh, participation in OMA as a non-architect, as you claim? No, we were just uh, uh, coloring their uh, drawings. We were not participating in, not in, in any way, basically. Process? Not in the design uh, but the techniques must have contributed in some way, no? Like did they? We first just colored it in, and then, then I made some collages for the first yes. uh, for Rem, and he orchestrated the collages, and some I did by myself. It was sort of this trip in New York, the Casabella competition, which was a, they used this uh, competition to make a. A continuous the monument, the basically, and through, um, through uh, London. Mm -hmm. and the uh, Exodus project. So yeah. I think we have a slide of that as well. Ma here we go, yeah. Yeah, so they made sort of, it was because Rem went to Berlin and to his surprise, he realized that the people who were free were completely imprisoned by the wall. You, we always thought, yeah, we put a wall in between 
They said, no, it was complete. <laughs> and that was, that made his idea that you could imprison people and be free, mm -hmm. you know, and the people outside are the, are the, the miserable, you know, they want to come to this free thing, so people so were escaping to imprisonment, mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> So who, what was the, um, the working process for a drawing like this? Sorry? What was the working process for, for this drawing? No, Ren was orchestrating. He was saying, we want these guys, the prisoners, the, you know, the voluntary prisoners of wow. architecture, it was called. Yeah. And we want these voluntary prisoners very happily running in white suits. I don't know why, but... <laughs> 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 and then, you know... He said, we have to have this picture in it and that picture, so I had to cut out, cut out all the pictures and stuck it together. There was no uh, high tech, uh <laughs> 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 now you don't, you go like this and you've got <laughs> it all <laughs> <laughs> on the computer. And that was his, um, his Belfort Palace Hotel. And the skills. And he used my, Painting in the top as well. Yeah, have, if you go to the next club. slide, uh, club. If you go one slide, yeah, there's. Uh, I did a yeah, yeah, you yeah. made the picture. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a three-dimensional arrangement of your painting, uh, the club for patrons. Yeah, there were clubs up. in the in the top one, different clubs. There and was what? Also there was it also a um, Russian constructivist club, and there was a watery club, and there was whatever. I don't and remember. I'm, I'm curious because this painting, if I remember correctly, is quite large. Yeah, so the scale big. of the work changes. Was that something that came from OMA or was this already, was there an art no, I was market? That I was painting that in acrylic, yeah. But was the, the, the scale changed? But it was his drawing. Mm -hmm. But was I it only drew, I always in his drawing drew the hand, free hand <laughs> things in the but were they produced, let's say, um, specifically for OMA, or were they also produced with a certain art market in mind, like the Protech um, gallery shows you no, mentioned? No, we were, were lucky that we could survive on selling some of the paintings, right. because it was... Uh, it was w one of the questions was if, um, <laughs> if, if your work ever financed OMA, and I think it did, right? Yeah, some of the paintings were sold by this paper company, what was it? Gorman? No, what were they called? I don't uh, know. Oh, the Gilman collection. Gilman, Gilman yeah, collection Gilman That's paper a, company, yeah, they uh -huh. collected yeah. some of it. Uh. And he gave a lecture, so I had to make a Primat Critical in New York. <laughs> <laughs> it was my painting of the dance theater, the first one. You can't see the no, you can't see the... And this is, in, in the first version, um, it was already supposed to have a mural by you, right? The, the, um, the sort of black yeah, square but it? I just, as a joke, uh, I was so fed up having to always make new marble walls. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll, as a joke, make those dancers, and then they won't see their dancers, because I make them between the dancers more prominent. But then, suddenly somebody rang up and said, can you make that uh, mural? I said, no, that was a joke. It was just marble, another <laughs> bit of marble. <laughs> so I was forced to make that mural then mm -hmm. for the real world. <laughs> <laughs> These are all for the Paris uh, house. One of the first things. And here we... Oh. Here's the last mural. But I changed the color to the original one a bit. I wanted Which has less nothing color, to yeah. Oh. Which because they had to repaint it. They said, no, repaint it then in the original version. Because it was a more pinkish uh, color before. It right? was more obscure. I wanted the obscurity was sort of lost when it was in color. And sorry, just to go back one, I had you mentioned something as well because the building now has been demolished uh, several years ago, um, unfortunately, I would say. But 
the mural, there was a question if you wanted they to. They called me, yeah, do you want that mural? I said, no, that belongs to that building. If that building goes, the mural goes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you see the process of murals? I'm curious about, because all your, like, the early work up until this point is so much about interiors and, and sort of like but, but in your, our own interiors or the spatial. Um, but the murals are always a sort of, you know, it's a very different approach. And you did more murals, which we might get to later. Is it a very different? Well, once you go, well, this was just uh, forced upon me, but the other ones, uh, the other mural, they are asking me to. Uh, to do a mural for uh, building a site of uh, where people lived mm -hmm. and housing. And there was in Heerle, there was a, do we go to the next one? Yeah. Okay, the we, we have a slide of that later on. Um, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll, get, <laughs> we'll, we'll return <laughs> to that, we'll, we'll hold that question. Yeah. This was the, this was for the Casabella, the, they used this cover that was from the, Voluntary prisoners, mm. and they're praying on a <laughs> on tiles, <laughs> <laughs> praying for something to grow there. <laughs> <laughs> but in a, in a way, your work was doing a huge work for OMA, right? Like was kind of allowing to have a circulation of images that were uh, conveying stories of architecture that were much more complex than what was done for competitions or what. Mm. Uh, where many other actors would be included, architecture was not seen as a kind of happy ending, or there were so many things that were happening in the images that you were producing that were circulated as the image of, of OMA, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't really know the answer to that. <laughs> Everybody can speculate what the reason is. I made this for a joke for a Christmas card, and then Charles Jenks said, "Oh, I'm doing something about the future and the past. Can I use it in my for my series?" And he put it in one of his books. That was Saint John, but he, ins he insisted it was the guy with the who is it? The guy with the lion. What was his name? Saint, uh, Saint Jer Jerome. Jer Jerome, I think. We were always fighting. No, it's St. John, no, it's St. Jerome, okay. <laughs> okay, number four, cardboard and cartoons. We, we move on to more contemporary work. Then I started to work in cardboard and because I, I love this gum strip that I, discuss, that I discovered in, uh, in America. They did everything, this gum strip stuck everything together. So you can make anything with gum strip and cardboard. So somebody asked me to make uh, an exhibition in her gallery uh, in London, and I made these people do my uh, uh, play my mind game that I invented. Uh, can, you, can you explain a little bit how the mind game works? Well, the mind game was a sort of a wall that I had on my. In my studio, I had a little cardboard wall with some of my collection in it, some objects. And everybody came in and said, no, you must do this object. Take this one. And so I said, oh, that's so typical. I'm going to ask everybody to make a set. And that's how the mind game uh, came to being, that I made a set of objects and people had to put it. And then we all had to analyze <laughs> it. Everybody had to analyze what they did. Mm. And uh, once uh, we took it to a dinner party and, and somebody said, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm not playing. Because <laughs> we were laughing about everybody, what they did, of course. We said, yeah, you're a bit of a, you know, people put it in a row. We said, you're a bit of a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a control freak or something, you know, mm -hmm. and we said, oh. And then he said, you're a control And then the boyfriend said, yes, she is. And then <laughs> 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 so it was so, it was always so blatant, every mm -hmm. what people do. It's like your handwriting. It's, you cannot do anything that is not you, yeah. typical, you know. Yeah. Very funny. 
<laughs> These were the guys waiting <laughs> on bicycles outside to be placed in Charlie's little gallery in Rotterdam, where we had a... We were obsessed with this crazy <laughs> program in America, which is called Botched. And there was one guy that was completely blue lips and blue he wanted... He said, I want uh, these guys who are doctors, who usually repair people, but this guy wanted galaxy realness. We said, yeah, we're going to have a galaxy realness exhibition. <laughs> so we put these guys, is that, is that the next thing? Um, yeah, we put these guys, yeah. shamelessly put a thing, with make it a sort of galaxy and a galaxy floor. Mm -hmm. So we had a galaxy realness exhibition. <laughs> this, this was for rewards, for... Uh, architectural review. Yeah, because you at one point you you got the re award. I got the reward, and I had a friend with me who said, "What a horrible reward! What a horrible! Where did you <laughs> get that?" And the woman said, "Yeah, I had no time. I went to a shop, and <laughs> I have three children." So, and he said, "You should ask the people who get the award to do the next one." So I said, "Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> I had to do the <laughs> four rewards <laughs> the next time." Four people who got the award. The we, we have Liz Diller receiving the award. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 this is one of the rewards. So, I made them out of paper again and painted them as if it was copper. <laughs> and uh, so, the photographer, what's her name? Um, French photographer. What's her name? Yeah. Hélène Binet, I made them with eyes. Mm. And this, mm. this is my one of my latest works, are clocks. <laughs> also cardboard and uh, clockwork. And that little guy was, I was in uh, St. Petersburg, <laughs> and we were with A students, we were going to this uh, cemetery. And there was a little boy that was just became sort of communist, had just fallen, communism. And there was a little boy with a table with all his toys. And I bought some of his toys. And we went to the cemetery. And late in the afternoon, we came back. And he was still standing there, this <laughs> little boy <laughs> with his toys. So I bought all the toys. And he ran home. He was so happy. <laughs> It was so terrible that time when people had no money and in a way they were sort of better off. A lot of poor people were better off with communism. When did you start making these clocks? Was that really something of the uh, last year? Or a year ago, yeah. Very yeah. How it was how a bit of a, of a lockdown syndrome uh -huh. where I started to make <laughs> lots of swans from, from milk bottles and... I just had some, uh, all my neighbors came with bottles and things to make. So I was just called it plastic surgery. <laughs> I was just <laughs> making, <laughs> 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 cutting all these milk bottles into shapes. <laughs> and, and these are all cardboard. That is pure paper and tape. Yeah. That was, th these were for uh, fundraising. And they're all lost now. I don't, we don't know where they are. <coughs> This was just cutting and trying to to do a bit of a Picasso thing where he has a sheet and he cuts it and turns it up. <laughs> All cardboard figures from uh, kitchen rolls. Now we move to the cartoons. That's funny. It's completely... <laughs> Now are always made cartoons for people. I don't know if whether no, not always used, but I kept and making the mm -hmm. them anyway. This is also where the <laughs> icon, sort of the idea of the icon emerged. Iconic, right? uh, imprisoned, iconic buildings, and you know, back to basics. And <laughs> <laughs> the architect is very happy to go back to basics. When did this whole um, this idea of the icon, did that was that in conversation with Charles Jenks or like how did that 
come about? Well, he was always to, to take talking about iconic buildings. Uh, he was. Um, they always had to uh, represent something. Mm. They had to be. Uh, just made a lot of drawings for him for his books. They're not here, but we cannot show everything, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> the signifiers, do you call them always signifiers? You had to. I find it always too literal, but he was just on and on. <laughs> and they always said, did you agree with what he said? I said, no, well, of course not, not always. <laughs> but it was very interesting still. He was sort of a sole proponent of everything had meaning and mm. every shape had another meaning. <laughs> this was for... <laughs> I had to make for freeze, that's where the cartoon started. For freeze, I had to, um, that's an exhibition in London, and they have uh, a blind sale of postcards. So they asked me to make three postcards for mm -hmm. freeze postcard sale. And these are the postcards for it. Next. <laughs> <laughs> This is the next one, and that's the other one. <laughs> Contemplating the chair. <laughs> that was another one. <laughs> These are all sort of random drawings. And then the These eggs. Are yeah. These are eggs that I painted. Uh, I painted uh, Trump drowning. I thought I could influence. <laughs> <laughs> I could influence. <laughs> and that is Ted Cruz drowning. <laughs> I want to, but obviously it didn't work at all. Because yeah. there is a <laughs> he was still he was still <laughs> voted in. There, is, I think we have some more also of, of there is a connection with with eggs and the sort of darker. This is an egg of my neighbor Lindsay Anderson, who was a <laughs> who was a filmmaker and a friend. That was for his seventieth birthday. Here are the. Uh, yeah, I made some eggs and they looked terrible, and my daughter said. Is that a dictator? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I said, no, it's just a funny guy on a, on a painted on an egg. And he said, she said, why don't you make the eggs of evil? Eggs of evil. Yeah. Yeah. Make <laughs> all dictators. So that was. I, think we, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have all so of them. I had them. to make uh, Mussolini mm. and Stalin and Hitler. Next, uh, pick <laughs> Putin. <laughs> Hitler, <laughs> they're all eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Mussolini. The more medals they have, the more horrendous dictator they are. Eh? Mm -hmm. They're always full of medals. <laughs> <laughs> what about the the egg? Maybe we can touch a little bit on it because your your the the early OMA logos you designed were of course the sort of egg, the Dali type of egg opening up with OMA coming coming out of it. And then here we have the egg as the sort of dictators. What, what, what know, happened well in between? Eggs hmm? Maybe something to do with it being a woman. Right. You're yeah. always full of eggs. Yeah. No? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But uh, did it sort of continue? Did I just have a problem with throwing things away. Yes. So I yeah. <laughs> a beautiful egg, you know. <laughs> so this was for, a uh, for an exhibition on Indian art. So I made a big elephant out of cardboard and tape and tape mm -hmm. and painted. Thank you. Yeah. Everybody collect uh, gum strip. You can do anything mm -hmm. with gum strip. Yeah. <laughs> Book covers and murals. <laughs> Everybody this getting bored now, yeah, already. Yeah. This, <laughs> this is a bit of an outlier, but. This is the one image you did for the Guggenheim. Uh, that was for the oh yeah. rotunda. I did an idol tower and I thought I'm going to make all the architects I know to make a room of their idols. Nobody did it <laughs> except my one friend of mine, Sylvia, who made an, uh, a 
a room for um, the guy with the spirals. What's his name? Because of the spiral. Frank Lloyd Wright? No. Who, who made a for format for a spiral? Um, I can't remember. It. Fibonacci. 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 She's got it. Fibonacci. There's one Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Fibonacci, one room for, uh, and the rest I had to just make myself. That's very disappointing. <laughs> this and was for a book covers. cover for a woman who wrote a book about um, the dinosaur coming from an egg, and uh, then she died. So it never happened. <laughs> People. <laughs> <laughs> who have my covers, they die. <laughs> I wouldn't ask me to make your cover. <laughs> 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 this was a, that was for Architez uh, cover, and there was all, all the icons iconic buildings. Yeah. The chess match between the iconic. These are all just illustrations. Uh, Fear of clowns. This was for Inge Niemann. He had this idea that you could put all the people who die, all their, you can make bricks out of the, <laughs> the ashes, and then you can make a pyramid, and the pyramid got bigger, so the whole world can be Everybody bigger, become a pyramid. Yeah. yeah. Everybody would be perfect. <laughs> yeah. So I had to make that for. This was for an alphabet. Yeah, I really love this one, and also maybe the next. Um, these are all for the alphabet book, right? Yeah, there's the D, and I didn't want <laughs> a D to be a word. I just wanted it to be a shape. So I was going to al alphabet this, the letters as shapes. That but the alphabet built. It, it was never finished, right? No, I, I got not further than the D, further than the D. <laughs> 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 With a lot of my work you stops <laughs> at the beginning. I was going <laughs> to ask about unfinished projects. I have my whole house is full of unfinished <laughs> projects. <laughs> is there any one particular you would <laughs> like to finish, or? No, I once made. You know, there was um, there was this uh, guy in Holland who made. Uh, what's his name? He knows. He knows this guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where are you? Uh, the, the guy who made Holland made from all the buildings. He made models, books with models. O one O. You know, it's ha Hans Oldebaris. You know. Oh, him? from the Utopia group. I don't know what yeah, group he belongs to, but he asked. He, so there was this the the pool. And he wanted, um, yeah, I don't have a picture of that. He wanted uh, the model of the pool as mm -hmm. a model, mm -hmm. yeah? The pool who... Uh, the OMA pool. Yeah. The, the pool that was uh, coming from this constructivist to right. New York and were very disappointed by the small size of it. Anyway, they swam towards New York, this, this pool, this floating pool. Anyway, he wanted to make me to make a model, and I make I made. I thought it's too boring. To it's just a rectangle, and he said, "Yeah, let's just build that rectangle." I said, "No, let's." So I made a wave, mm. and put a pool on a tiny little pool on the <laughs> top of the wave. <laughs> you could have put it anywhere, yeah, <laughs> under the wave, on top of the wave, and. Hans Oliver was going to come, but he was too lazy. Rem said, yeah, he's too lazy. He won't come to London. He said he was going to come to see the model and to s advise. And there was a whole story collected, the whole things that the, the swimmers would have, you know, pickled mushrooms and, <laughs> and things, <laughs> what they were eating. Well, 40 years of swimming towards New York. <laughs> but uh, that whole project went... So I still have a box with this wave, mm -hmm. with this wave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, there's the mural. Is this that's the here. Mural? Yeah. yeah, I liked the, I, I found everything in, in, in nowadays is a whisper, is Chinese whispers. 
somebody says yeah. something and it goes around the world and it comes out completely different and that's the the sort of the horror of this time where mm -hmm. nobody understands anybody else's words or everything gets distorted so I, this is Chinese whispers and I wanted this one sort of double mm -hmm. but they said no no there's too many different colors yeah so I had to make it m more simple so that's what it became in the end that's interesting no you say this the sort of horrors of this world are described by nobody understanding. Yeah, the, the, the horrors of the world of nobody understanding anything that mm -hmm. anybody's been saying. And uh, now with where everybody can make people say anything, mm -hmm. it's completely lost, you know, all, all the truth, everybody's truth is going mm -hmm. to be watered down to... <laughs> but I find this very interesting, this sort of balance between that observation let's say and your early work which also in the sort of surrealist sense really relies on you know misinterpretation or chance encounters or also the myth yeah i used basically. to be very interested in, in misinterpretation because it was so much more interesting often than reality but mm -hmm. now it's become sort of like a sort of a tsunami of misinterpretation mm -hmm. <laughs> there's too much of it now less interesting when you're uh, on one side of it and this, this is, is uh, uh, Istanbul this was this Istanbul the two culprits are there they started it all <laughs> Mark and Beatrice. their biennale mm -hmm. in uh, Istanbul that was about uh, the, the the loss of hands doing things with your hands and I I'm always thinking, if you do things with your hands, your your hands sometimes inform your brain. So to you have to start drawing, you have to make things to, to enrich your thinking. And uh, that's people doing things on computers. The sort of information from the hand is, is getting mm -hmm. lost. Th that and that's what I was going to... That was part of what you were teaching, right? At the AEA, for instance. That you yeah, I did teaching. a lot of workshops where people had to make these things with this gum strip mm -hmm. and yeah. rubbish and had to make things. Maybe we can speak a bit about your teaching as well. Yeah. Um, you started no, teaching... I don't basically teach. I make people do things. I <laughs> say, <laughs> 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 so come, come on, do this. Mm -hmm. But you started in the 80s, you started basically at the AA, right? And, and color Oh, yeah, we did color workshops yeah. where we made people color yeah. their drawing because there was not much color before. So <laughs> <laughs> we, but then color, of course, took off like mm -hmm. nobody's business. And you taught those with Zoe and Gallus together? Uh, yeah, we yeah. all we did the yeah. color workshops together. First we did this uh, color for Zaha and then we said, these people, they don't know how to do any paint, paint mm -hmm. how to paint. So we said we must get them early. So we did a very early yes. color workshop. And you taught with Zaha together as well? Or no, we didn't teach. We just said, put color yes. on your drawing. Yes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want I want push. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, number seven, yes. Charles and Lina. That was a book cover I did for Charles, and I proposed this, and he didn't like it, so he wanted to be it to be like the uh, the first uh, the captive globe paintings I made for Ren. And uh, how d how did you meet uh, Charles Jenks and you? Sorry? How did you meet? How, how did, did we the meet? First? Yeah. Oh, he, he was, Rem was a student of Charles. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles was always inviting people who did disagreed with Rem. And he said, <laughs> you, you come and have dinner and you start to fight. You believe this, you believe that, fight <laughs> it out. <laughs> <laughs> and he was hap so happy about it <laughs> to have, you know, conversations. And uh, so... That was the introduction, you know, and then 
so this was the sketch for the cover and i think then the next is the actual cover which if you go one one <laughs> further are you oh yeah, yeah you are doing that yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I was told how to do this but <laughs> they said don't touch the bottom because <laughs> it will explode the whole thing <laughs> it will explode it will explode so <laughs> good that you're doing it <laughs> this was a he had a party a cosmic party so i had to do a, a design for his jacket and his hat of course he didn't like the hats <laughs> <laughs> obviously <laughs> so this was what i the result of that uh, jacket. He, he bought a jacket in a shop where you, for chef mm -hmm. jackets. And then I drew that on. <laughs> <laughs> That's me with m being a moon. <laughs> <laughs> and this, uh, I helped him with his project for, um, for, uh, so I did a lot of his paintings for him, for his um, gardens. He did uh, en enormous uh, parks and gardens. And so this was, uh, uh, this was being built, but it's of course not at all, look <laughs> doesn't look like this at all. Where was this? It's in Scotland. It's Scotland. always, everything is in Scotland. This is for five in Scotland as well. This was um, another icon, the iconic book on icons. Mm. Had to be Marilyn. That was a signifier. Marilyn Monroe's skirt mm -hmm. blowing up. And this was for uh, Maggie Center, for a room. <sighs> yeah, it takes too long to explain what the Maggie Schenker is about, mm. but it was, um, she had cancer and she, there was no room for the people to sort of. And Maggie was Charles Jenks' wife. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and she, uh, she was sit, when she heard, she was sitting in the, when people come by, you know, the nurses and say, are you all right? <laughs> so, and it was so horrible that, you just hear that you have cancer mm. and there's no place to where to be alone or to be with somebody who and explains to you what it's all about, what you can do, mm. you know. So this is the room and I thought I make all these people have this cancer, but they all have different backgrounds. So I made all this, the backgrounds, different colors. And for which Maggie Center, because there's many Maggie Centers, right? It's all designed by famous yeah, architects. Yeah, all the architects made. And for which one was? Maggie Center. This was for Richard Rogers' one yeah. in uh, London. Yeah. Big orange building. It's another egg for Maggie that I made. This is a part of my, uh, of my objects that are shown in uh, the the show that is in my uh, my work in the Charles Jenks' house. Which is currently on a lot view, of, right? Uh, plastic surgery is there. So <laughs> 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 but this is in his library, which is a crazy library. Very funny. All the all the bookcases, uh, all the cabinets are painted. It's all postmodern. Very postmodern house. And uh, this is a chandelier made out of hands. We called it a handelier that is hanging <laughs> in the. <laughs> <laughs> hanging in the. <laughs> and this is body parts, <laughs> cushions. <laughs> and there's my, my clock, the but clock it's French so French. much yeah. blends into the background that nobody knows it's my clock. <laughs> because it has the same colors as the vases mm. for some reason. It's very funny. And here's my installation of little chairs in the Lina Bobardi house. When, when did you first learn about Lina Bobardi? What was your first I encounter? I went there in 2006 and discovered her, that um, amazing architect. And she did the Sesk building is 
She, she was there for 10 years in that yeah. building. Uh, it was a barrel factory. And her husband was asked, do you know any architect who uh, can re remodel this sort of uh, factory into a thing for public, you know, with lots of different things to do there and a swimming pool and uh, restaurants and just a whole sort of community center. And he said, yeah, my wife, <laughs> <laughs> she can do it. And uh, she had already done his museum, his art museum, MASP, which is a beautiful building. And when mm. I asked, when I was there, I asked people, do you know what this building, who did it? They didn't know who mm. did ever. She was sort of not known. And said, yeah, probably Niemeyer. <laughs> It's very th and she made an amazing uh, gallery in it and for people to do study who didn't have a room in their house to study and she made swimming pool and mm. she made uh, workshops where people could make uh, well this was part of the some of the chairs that I put in that in that uh, fireplace in her house. And I thought I could, <laughs> that was my miscalculation, I thought I could put those chairs like an egg hunt that people come in and have to find those chairs. Because Lena had this, her room was full of objects and things and chairs. And so when I came there with my chairs, suitcase full of little chairs. Mm -hmm. Hans Uhr Obrist had completely made it into a gallery. There was nothing there, so yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. So I looked at the fireplace and said, yeah, well, I put it in the fireplace then. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It was not the plan. So funny enough, it fitted exactly in that fireplace. Mm. Yeah. This was for Lina Babardi show. We did... Um, was uh, showing all this. It was not about her drawings or anything, but just about her collections and things. I made those issues that were uh, little devils. There's a candomblé uh, voodoo type of mm. uh, mm -hmm. celebrations. And you made many of them at the... And I made big show. ones for the... The Lina Bobardi show. Mm -hmm. This was a. This was the real one I bought in uh, the metal ones. You could. Everybody was collecting these in the uh, in the north of Brazil. There was a lot of this voodoo uh, sort of. But they were funny. Funny. It was very in um, mixed with Christianity because all those missionaries that came to Africa. They saw this peep, these guys with this was all with horns. They said, "Those are devils." They introduced, you know, guilt and all that stuff, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was just uh, people having, the, you know, the the horns of animals. So it got very mixed with Christianity and voodoo. In in Brazil, it was very much a uh, very funny mix. The red is. Uh, Christian, uh, what I did, I did, they were guys who were, these these two were Cosmos and Damien, the, they were um, deities, and they were uh, Syrian doctors who healed all the poor people with herbs. If you go back, they were always having herbs in their hands. And this these were usually Christian, uh, Cosmos and Damien, but they were adopted by mm -hmm. the voodoo people, and they made those eshus, they call them. And uh, so there were always mm -hmm. these two guys. <laughs> and they dressed up like eshu for the candomblé cer ceremonies. This was the... the 
sacrificial thing for the Lina Bobardi. She had made this beautiful building, this random holes for sports. And in every, it was an amazing mixture of art and, you know, sport. And she, wherever she could, she made an amazing art piece. So she made a floor that was, comp you know, that has all the sports things on it, mm -hmm. different sports. Yeah. And she made sort of beautiful paintings on the floors where people, so, you know, sport and art was all always mixed. You know, it was so such an amazing uh, architect. Everybody has to study Lina Bobardi. <laughs> Many people have visited right recently. You know, uh, okay. That's where the hands were made for the Lina Bobardi show where she ha always drew his hands on her drawings. This is a flat version. You fold it and glue it and this was in the, the show collection of the things we collected for the. I think we reached the the last yeah. section, which uh, your show, your your famous show, was called. Now the you World can go very fast because <laughs> everybody wants to go and have <laughs> dinner. <laughs> I mean, we have this, this is was again the, the this mind. was the critical pursuit. Yeah, this home analysis kit. Everybody can be a, a Freudian or a Jungian. How did it start, the, the show? Because the, the show is very unique, right? It was showing uh, photographs of your apartment in London uh, with all your collection. Yeah, they, the two guys from the AA, uh, Shimon and Stefan, they came to my house in, the, what was it, 2006 or something. And they said, we want to make a, a show of your work. I said, I haven't got any work. <laughs> it's all <laughs> old stuff, you know. And they said, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, you make, uh, you have to make a big painting and for it. And you have to be showing all your, your whole, in we take your whole studio. I said, yeah. <laughs> we have some photos of your <laughs> studio. Yeah? And they started all this little, <laughs> toys that I have, they started to wrap it into paper. I said, don't worry, they, they can't throw them <laughs> all in a box, you know. <laughs> I had collecting all these crazy things like a baby, the smoking baby and <laughs> incongruous things that this was uh, on. This was all the objects from the thing and I did made these for the Biennale, the extra things. The devil, the fish and the book and the snake. Go on. That's one of the sets. It's the, the box game, with right? uh, <laughs> the objects. This was the objects in the AA. This was the first uh, that Shimon and Stefan did, Shimon Bazaar. You have to go faster, but it's <laughs> 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 this is uh, in the AA as well, the people making sets. Next, next. Here, I'll, I'll do it. You go too <laughs> slow. <laughs> Is it a paper foot? <laughs> the fish? <laughs> <laughs> Here we That's go. Your My studio. studio. That's the studio. <laughs> Tell us a bit more about your studio. How you, how it ended up happen, happening? How it ended up happening? It just how, happened uh, naturally. Place, uh, I was yeah. just collecting things and, <laughs> and, and making things and uh, always sort of busy. You lived in the same place for 55, was it 50 years? No, we li 48 years, we lived in the same years. house, yeah. yeah. So that's why it became so... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a system, an organization there? No, and this was 
a friend, uh, Natalini, Adolf Natalini, had an exhibition that said, Life Without Objects. He gave me the poster and he drew, I said, what happened to you? And he drew a little bit in the corner that was his first uh, the Fontaine's monument. And then he drew his postmodern. He became a postmodernist. I said, what happened? <laughs> I said, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and he gave me the post. <laughs> he at l and later on, I, uh, there was somebody from Super Studio, the guy who did all the uh, coll uh, collages, I think. And I, s I told him that uh, Adolfo said sorry. And he said, yeah, he should. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is my li then I was pushed out of my studio and this is my living room. And that became also like completely filled with, and everybody <laughs> brought me in with COVID all their plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. like, Here, do some, make something out of it. Yes, as I'm very obedient, I did. <laughs> 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 and these were, boxes for mushrooms and I made bulldog and uh, this was the others and this were my favorite collection smoking baby the father Christmas with wings <laughs> 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 I still don't know what this this is a, a, a Chinese somebody must explain this to me. Why this mask with the hand <laughs> over it? I don't understand. I've never understood why that was. But yeah. these are objects, objects. This was religion, sex, and death <laughs> together. <laughs> I thought <laughs> that's my <laughs> This is all uh, Day of the Dead figures. And there's Marilyn Monroe, and I have to always blow her skirt up for people to realize it's her. D this is in your home, or was it in the exhibition? This is at my in my house now. Because there is the. I got all these cupboards mm -hmm. and uh, filled them with my stuff. But what I find fascinating about the cupboards is that it's a grid. So there is <laughs> a. Well yeah, now they have seemed. First it was all mixed up, but now I had I was grew so much that everybody came with, <laughs> here is something for your, something ugly, here you will like it. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to then um, tell people, don't ever give me anything bigger than your nail. <laughs> so they gave me this tiny glass, <laughs> insects and things. Very funny. This was for, uh, I had to, paint somebody's dogs and I just couldn't make a portrait of a dog so I put them in a random <laughs> so that I can't make a portrait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why ugly? People this think that these things are ugly? What? People offer you ugly things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah they, I like ugly things uh, somehow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Or things that are strange. You don't know mm -hmm. what people, I thought, I see an object, I said, what were they thinking, making <laughs> that? You call them freaks of culture. Is that call right? it freaks yeah, of freaks culture. Of culture. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember also but that once you see. People who are misunderstand another culture, but yeah. they do appropriate. Yeah. So every culture has uh, Mickey Mouses. They yeah. Every country has their own Mickey Mouse. I have a Minnie Mouse in Indian dress. I know I have, <laughs> I have a, a coral Mickey Mouse made by Chinese, from carved from coral. I mean. But Madeno, I remember you once told me that many people come to you and say, I found something very ugly that I'm sure you will love it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you will respond like, yeah, but that's not my ugly, right? No, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's your ugly, that's your sorry. <laughs> <laughs> These are random uh, drawings, another random drawing. These are, this case Christian, so I made this for his uh, 
Rotterdam Biennale, as he wanted a, he wanted a chess set. The icons versus the modern. So we made right? the old architecture, the new iconic architecture, fight each other. Of course, Charles Jinks thought it was a good one. <laughs> this was for the Thalys going from, Ams oops, sorry, going from Amsterdam to um, to Paris. So I made all the souvenirs I had from these countries on mm -hmm. on a landscape of the famous paintings that were made in Holland, Belgium, and and uh, France. Where are all the Objects. This was the one of the. Let's see. This I threw all the objects together, and I thought I can put this on the dustbins, mm -hmm. but they couldn't bend that plastic around the dustbin, so it was never used. This was for. Uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, they had a, they have all these models, of architecture models, and they were, people were asked to do, respond to, and I had the Stein House, Bertolt Stein House, that he did, and I did the foot on top, and I had this foot already, mm. and he was hated uh, <laughs> the meter, he said, that's not a... Le Corbusier, we're talking about. Corbusier. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he said the foot was the proper measurement. So I made this foot with a building on top. This, uh, <laughs> 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 this super m model man. <laughs> the <laughs> four points of the thing. And <laughs> he also grabbed the sky as one of the points of architecture. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> how megalomania can you get to, to uh, take the sky as well? So this was uh, these are all the objects that went everywhere. This are uh, the cupboards in the AA. This is the man before he was painted. Here you see that it's made out of paper, tape, and cardboard. This was the Biennale installation. This was the Berlin installation. This was in the Biennale as well. I don't mm -hmm. know where this was. Maybe it was Basel. This was in Basel. You see here the, the juicers from America. Mm. Here the kids playing. That was the funny thing. People played sort of like, yeah, do something nice. But the children had always played with a story. Mm -hmm. They said, this has to go there. They said, they all had a reason for putting. It was really amazing. And this was the book. This was in the AA. This was the collection. Before it was all separated into scenes. This is the AA, the AA. This was in was this? This was Basel, Basel as I well. Think, yeah. This is the workshops where I make people do, make things from a painting. So they made this funny thing with teeth. This was a Biennale in, uh, in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. We made a long table and I did make the children make uh, Call them pagodas for the uh, decoration. And this was in Porto. I made them from Miro, and we called it Less is Miro. <laughs> <laughs> These are all my swans from plastic milk bottles. These are my soldiers <laughs> from uh, Sif bottles. <laughs> I want to be buried with all these soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> This was this the installation in the cosmic house of Charles Jenks in his mi jacuzzi. This is a monster fish from milk bottles. This is from mm -hmm. 20 milk bottles, a dragon. And this is all your most 
Let's these say are recent work. These right? are all recent. my milk bottles, the latest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <A> bulldog. Uh, <laughs> this was from. I was so happy to find that bottle because it had already arms. <laughs> <laughs> it was for the <laughs> toilet cleaner. <laughs> I thought, wow, I only have to make hands and a uh, hat, and that's <laughs> it. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> this is, there we go, quick, 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 quick. Yeah. This is my last yeah. stock explaining where babies come from. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>
He was just such a genius. And uh, now I, I always try to play monk. It's very difficult. But I had a boyfriend who now sent me all the monk every birthday. He sent me. He learns a new monk priest, which is really difficult. And uh, he's a he's a composer himself. And uh, last birthday I had, which was themed not eighty, <laughs> 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 and. He played all my favorite monk pieces. And my grandson, who is very musical, he was so intrigued. By, so I'm hoping he's <laughs> going to be a monk fan as well. He's only 10 or 11 now. Do you listen to music while you work? Huh? Do you listen to music while you're working? I, ha always? I have to listen to music, otherwise I can't work. Yeah. And That's my ADHD. You have to... <laughs> Some of mm -hmm. your brain has to be distracted because you have several levels of, of, of attention. And I had an amazing teacher in Montessori school who made me, who, who I could draw while he was talking. And he realized I had to do something with my hands to be able to listen to the lecture. Yeah, so I, I still have so. this. I have to. I have to, even people talking, I have to listen to radio or music. I think that's a common practice at USAP as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I wanted to follow up as well. The I was wondering if you ever branch into other improvisational free jazz artists as well, like uh, Ornette Coleman, for example. Yeah, so I love or Ornette Coleman too. Outside of piano yeah. specifically. But thank you. Well, <laughs> all the people that age, I mean, Charlie yeah, Parker. Sonny Rollins, uh, all the, the uh, Thank you for the lecture. Um, ever since the first time I see your um, photos of your object, I've had this question, so I feel like <laughs> I have to ask, um, do they collect dust and do you clean them? And, <laughs> you know, what do you do with cardboard and materials that, you know, doesn't do well with water? <laughs> And and the last question would be, do you feel like when they enter into the museum or Biennale and gets into the um, like clear container glass box, does does that change the status of them as objects? Yeah, they they all have different spaces, so you have to make sort of room in 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 the Basel. They had an enormous room thing with shelves, so I could put everything, but in smaller spaces you have to make a, a smaller selection. But and um, what about the dust? <laughs> <laughs> do, do it's very difficult to choose. <laughs> <laughs> so let other so people like do it. Are they, um, like in your apartment, for, for example, do you have people help you clean them? Do you clean them yourself? Or I people clean sorry? Them? Do, do you clean the objects yourself? I have a cleaner, a Brazilian yeah. cleaner. It's fantastic. Yeah. Do you <laughs> clean She's them up uh, and like wipe them? or Hard work at the poor thing, yes. Yeah, okay. I just collect things too and I find dust very annoying, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, I had a cleaner before who looked at my thing and, and a collection and said, I'm not cleaning that. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay, all right. Well, Maybe one more, right? Maybe there's one more question. Last Valerio, one. Valerio. Last, <laughs> last question for you. So thank you for your work, incredible. And uh, I've always been curious about your relationship with surrealism. Well, of I mean, is it a a real love or something that just happened and stays there and uh, well it's, it's also a, a thing of putting incongruous things together that's you know it's the same as as, as Polonius monk jazz you know you put all the notes in a sort of a mixed up thing and and different rhythm he on purposely he did funny rhythm that people couldn't uh, Instead of a seventh one, he did a sort of an eight, and suddenly people couldn't follow. He was always trying to subvert the music, and 
that Dali is subverting and in a way I'm subverting, you know, the and, and also that's why I don't have a gallery because I, I feel like that it becomes a commercial enterprise, you know, the galleries. You start to work for a gallery and I think that's quite, you have to work for yourself. You know, you have to work for, for y you know. So I find the in double interesting that, uh, I mean, Remkulas in the book talks about Dali, but at the beginning you were not part of the book. It happened because somebody else. Yeah, it just happened. You. So it's, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. No, it's of course incredibly uh, arrogant stance because people have to live from their work, you know, and they have to have a gallery and, you know, they have to make money to live. But I was always lucky that I had, there was always other things that I could do or, and work with Rem and sell the paintings that I did for him. So I was sort of, and I, I, I didn't need so much, you know, I didn't need a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would never sort of, I always lived quite frugally, you know. Dalia, yes. Amazing lecture, and you seem so amazingly free as a person. Why do you think freedom mm -hmm. is so under, underestimated? among people, like why, why do you think other things are considered more important than freedom? Like, like money, or mm. like um, <laughs> pain? No, I'm not saying I don't like money, I love it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> 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 no, it's just that, um, I don't want to have to do work that can be sold, you know. I mean, who wants to buy a, a plastic milk bottle uh, <laughs> conversion, you know? <laughs> Nobody. You, ca you can't sell it to the streets. I should give it to people, you know. Mm. And make exhibitions in museums or, you know. I know it's super arrogant to, to, to do that in a way, but it's my, <laughs> my reasons. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.